You're listening to Fit Pro Sessions with Parallel Coaching, episode number 10. Hi, I'm Neil Bergman, and in today's podcast, I'm talking to Ricky Knight from PT100K Club, all about the importance of having a business mindset while starting out as a fitness professional. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Neil Bergman. And I'm Hayley Bergman. Over the last 10 years, we've helped thousands of fitness professionals to get qualified, learn with simplicity, and coach clients with confidence. We're the first to say that learning and being a fit pro doesn't have to be hard work, and that with the right structure, support, and resources, you can become a confident and knowledgeable fitness professional that is dedicated to more. So how do you learn, qualify, and kickstart as a fit pro? This is the Fit Pro Sessions podcast with Parallel Coaching. A massive warm welcome to yourself, Ricky. Um, I want to spend a couple of minutes just to acknowledge you before I pass you over to find out um, who you are and where you've come from. But I first met you or heard of you back in 2014, 2015 and jumped inside one of your programs because I saw you as the, the expert in Facebook advertising, which is probably one of the topics we'll go on to today. Um, mm-hmm. But I, first off, I just want to thank you for the the education you've given me and that's allowed me to go and reach literally hundreds and thousands more people uh, than I than I ever thought I could so I just wanted to start off and acknowledge that um, and say thank you so no thank you Neil I'm looking forward to uh, the podcast mate I'm like really excited to uh, be on your show so uh, no thank you as well fantastic so over to you uh, Ricky tell everybody tell the listeners who is Ricky Knight where, where have you come uh, from? Give us a, a, a brief overview of life to date. Yeah, sure. Okay. So the first 17 years of my working career were in the financial services industry, which was uh, interesting. Lots of ups and downs. In 2004, I actually, that's when I first went into business on my own in the financial services industry. When I say on my own, that's when I became a business owner with a couple of other partners. And we then uh, had a very successful brokerage in Northampton, Milton Keynes, Luton, across those areas, that, that, that M1 corridor. And we built this company up to turning over just under 2 million a year. And we had like about 32 staff, brokers in lots of different estate agents' offices. And then everything came crashing down in 2008. So um, at that point, I was forced to reconsider things a little bit because uh, I'll admit, actually, I'll be the first to admit that I was a uh, a bit of a dick back then in my 20s and um, everything had come fairly effortlessly. And so I was just a little bit of um, the sort of guy that if I met today, I'd want to punch, basically. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Um, But you learn from this, don't you? So uh, went through all that, and that was a golden opportunity for me then to change careers. It really was, because we lost everything, company cars and lost the home that we were living in and had to go and live with in-laws and all this sort of stuff. But instead of changing careers at that point, I was too scared to, yeah, too wow. scared to do it at that point then uh, because I didn't know anything else. And I was really well qualified in the financial services industry. So it just seemed to make sense to stay in it. However, the UK was screwed. So uh, I looked overseas and so uh, moved out to Dubai. My wife was pregnant at the time, living with, as I say, my in-laws. So I moved out to Dubai for, to go and test it out, uh, to go and try and sell financial services products offshore to rich expats. Did that for six months, realized again, it wasn't quite the thing that got me excited. I didn't want to move the family out there. So came back and then just started up another business, but still in financial services. Um, looking back, Probably a mistake. As I say, it was really an opportunity because like, we didn't have m- many overheads at that point. That was the time to have switched, but I didn't. I started a new business in my in-law's garage. I remember it's freezing cold. It's snowing outside. <laughs> I had one of those little portable heaters next to me and I was doing cold calls and just like banging the phone and just trying to like get business. And Anyway, um, that grew into a successful business, a brokerage um, over over a few years and then come 2000 and late 2011 i just again like the the just sucking the life out of me i was so so down mid 30s two kids not enjoying life at all and um but still very very 
nervous about switching careers. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I'd let myself get out of shape uh, just because of the working hours. I, I got I ballooned in, in weight, got the proper dad bod. And, um, and it was then that my wife, Alex, she said, what do you really love? And it, actually at that point, I'd started to sort my fitness out a little bit. And she'd also gone on her journey because when she had our second child, she'd sort of got to three and a half, four stone overweight. And so Alex had gone through her journey. I'd seen her transform and lose, lose a load of weight. And then I, I kind of started getting in shape myself. And it just, there was an interest there in, in health and fitness. And so, and I enjoyed it. Um, and so it, we had this conversation and, and Alex said, look, if you could do anything, what would it be? And I said, I, I don't a gym. And she's like, well, train, like train to become amazing, a professional amazing. trainer and start there. And so it's like, you know what, let's have a look into this. And the interesting thing, Neil, with this is that I, I never, at, at no stage did it cross my mind that I was going to go into the industry to be a personal trainer. Wow. I had to do that yep. initially because I had to start right at the bottom. So I had to get the qualifications. I had to um, start out doing a boot camp in a field. I remember it was just as the London Olympics were on in 2012. That's when I launched it. And you know, I, I had to do that just to get my head around the industry and um, cause you, you know, knew from a get go, money. you knew from a get go that actually it was about being a business owner. You know, you've absolutely, you've grown this, you've grown a previous business, even though you, exactly it, it went, it, it all came crashing down around you and you tried again and it was successful, but you were doing something that you, I suppose, loathed towards the end yes. of it. You knew yes. at the, if you took an element of Ricky Knight, you knew that you were a business owner. Yes. And, and not somebody that just is in the business. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I understood. So that was always in my head. It wasn't, I'm going to become a great personal trainer and I can't wait to train people because actually when you look at it, you go onto Google and see, you know, average earnings of personal trainers in the UK. What is it? 17 grand, 18 grand, something like that. If yeah, you're lucky. It, it varies. It varies, but you're, you're ballpark 16 to 20,000, isn't it? In the UK. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and the thing is at this point, you know, we, we had, we'd moved into the house and, you know, two kids and I, there's absolutely, you know, I was 35 at this point. I, I could not afford to support my family on a personal trainer's wage. So it wasn't even an option. It was not an option. It was a case of, right, let's start this business and let's, let's own a gym but it was a business owner's mentality because there's yeah. no way I could afford to support my family on a personal trainer's salary. What I find re really interesting, one of your, one of your comments was for the, for the most part of my career was 17 years inside the financial world. And then the uh, kind of 2012, it kind of, that's almost at the end of your career. Mm. Do you consider that fitness as a, as a fitness business owner, do you consider that as your career or something that you, just get to do and you love it. <laughs> it's almost like you've, you've, you've said the, the financial industry was my career and now, now I'm just in love with life, in love with what I do and it doesn't almost feel like a career or work. Yeah, the thing is, um, I think one of the things I've recognized is that I've got a genuine passion for, for business, just business. And there were a lot of skills that I picked up in those previous two businesses that I was able to transfer across to this. When it comes to growing a business, strategy-wise, it's pretty much the same in any industry. Principles, it doesn't matter whether you're in the financial industry, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, the engineering, or fitness. No, Principles no. It really, it really doesn't. Yeah. It really doesn't. And so... How can I put this? Um, I wouldn't say that I've got this overwhelming passion for the health and fitness industry. My passion is in business. And it, right now, it so happens to be in the health and fitness industry. But um, it's, it's, and, and I think it's, it's a bonus, really, that 
I like to keep fit myself. I understand the benefits. Certainly for those that are, um, you know, middle age and above, I, I, I really see the huge benefits that can have that ripple effect on their friends, their mm. family, when people yes. get in shape, the, the huge transformations you can have. There was an enormous amount. One of the things that surprised me, actually, in the early days, even though I entered the industry not intended to be a personal trainer, I was, I was at first, and I got, this is the surprise, an enormous amount of job satisfaction out of helping these, these ladies transform. Like they would come in and see me and they, the body language, the hair was all down, not confident, um, on the, you know, depression, on the verge of like, just like this is my last chance, all this sort of thing. And then within the space of like, you know, three or four months, transformed. Yeah. Radiating energy, hair tied back, showing off their arms, just life-changing. Proud to and, be in themselves. Absolutely. And I was, it, it just took me back because they would just keep coming to me like, thank you, thank you. You've given me my life back. And I'm just like, geez, like, I wasn't expecting this. So there is an enormous amount of satisfaction out of knowing you're having that kind of impact on people's lives. And, and so right now, I still get that little like tingly feeling when I see, oh, I see say our location in Wakefield or our location in Basildon. And when they put up something on their page about a before and after about a lady that, and there's a story supporting that transformation. And I, I see our logo at the top of it. And it's Amazing. like, I, I just, I just sit here out in Spain and I see that. And it's just like, wow, you know, the, the stuff that we're doing right now, yeah. the commitment to growing around the country and all of this sort of thing. I still get that little that satisfaction in knowing that what we're doing is, is, is having a big impact on people's lives. I never had that in financial services. And, and even though you are located in Spain and you're not mm. physically on session um, with those people in, in, your, in your venues around, around the UK, that, mm. that decision back in 2012, whereby um, yourself and, and, and your wife had your own body transformation, yeah. that, that now kind of picked you up and put you on a new trajectory to impact mm. thousands more, you know, several mm. years later. So mm. your, would you say your own transformation where you were, you know, was it stuck in a garage um, doing cold calls and, and mm. you know, not loving life for nine hours a day or whatever, mm. kind of the polarity of, of being stuck, frustrated, tired, overwhelmed, not, not liking what you're doing. And all of a sudden you've got this kind of, um, newfound love for life or passion in the gym mm. where you, now to you, you you both shed a, a few pounds your feet you know the hair's tied back you're like oh, I, I feel yeah. great that transformation would you say did that help shift your focus and say right i'm going to pick the fitness industry because of your own transformation yes yes it, it just seemed to make sense it's not as if there was this this desire for years to enter the fitness industry yeah but yeah i mean the because we'd both gone through those those transformations ourselves and we 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 could see the benefits of it ourselves um and especially having two young children as well because it it was it was a case of you know good or bad your kids are going to model your behaviors and your actions and your habits and so it's 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 great that they you know, they have grown up in a house whereby they see us exercising all the time and they understand the importance of health and fitness. And so it was a case of inspiring them as well. But definitely at that point when it was a case of, I remember sort of sitting there with a pad of paper and like, you know, just writing down all the options. Um, definitely our own, our own personal transformations was, was something that was uh, sort of led us towards, it was in the credit column of like the health and fitness. Yeah, the catalyst to, to making this happen. Yeah. One, yeah. one thing that I found interesting, which I think we're obviously going to dive into very shortly, but I think it's relevant to us now is you went into your personal trainer qualifications knowing that I might have to do some 
boot camps. So I may have to operate mm. as a personal trainer for a mm. short time because mm -hmm. that gives you the kind of a credibility, the bread and butter, understanding the, the nature of the industry, but you need yeah. to be in business. Why do you think so many personal trainers or pe sorry, so many people train to become a fitness professional, mm. but don't want to go on and build a business? They, they, they only see themselves I'm going to do a PT course, therefore I'm now a personal trainer. And mm. they've, they've somewhat limited themselves. You know, you can only, you can go to the local, you know, um, gym, gym chain and, and earn 18,000. Mm. And then, the, you know, there's a saturated market, I suppose, with thousands of PTs. How do you, what, why, do you, why do you think people are, are staying as a, as a fitness professional and not seeing themselves as a fitness business owner? Um, cause you were very, you, you know, we're talking about for you, it was 2012. So this is, you're almost like way before the time. <laughs> yeah. In that, in that yeah. Thinking. I, I just think that if like, the conversations I have with personal trainers and, and so when I asked that question, why did you, why did you enter the industry? It's, it's interesting that most of the time they will say, I love helping people. Mm. Okay. And so for them, as far, as long as they feel like they are helping people, they feel like they are, they're, they're achieving what they set out to achieve. Yeah. Which is, which is nice. Yes. But reality soon kicks in when all of a sudden they realize there's a lot more to it than just having those shiny qualifications because all of a sudden there's, they're like, well, so many of them, when they do the courses, I think they think that, right, once I get these qualifications and I tell my friends on Facebook, I'm a, I'm a personal trainer, I am going to be, be flooded fully with, booked. Yeah, like, wow. It's personal training now. I've been waiting for this all my life. And you know, you might have a, with friends and family, a, a busy timetable for a couple of months, but that then dies off. The harsh reality like, of, yeah. I've exhausted my friends and family list. I've exhausted my old colleague list at work. And yeah, I, what do I do? How do I, how yes. do I get a client? And, and I'm no longer helping people. Yes, this is exactly it. And so that reality kicks in. And I think this is one of the reasons why so many then end up leaving the industry. Yeah. Um, because when they enter the industry, they, and I remember, actually, I remember being on our course and like they, they cover the marketing side of it, but it's so crap. Honestly, <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> it was a case of like, yeah. yeah, just do this. You can earn 30, 40,000 a I year think by. The problem with with uh, with uh, with uh, the course, I suppose, in, in that perspective, is is it's a tick box um, worksheet. And just yeah. because I've passed a worksheet and got, you know, the current worksheet or the new worksheet has got eighty one marks. Now I could be great at filling in a worksheet and I could get eighty one marks, but that doesn't mean I'm going to be a great business owner or understand social media, um, which is one of the reasons why we've put together our our business Kickstarter mm. because it's it's. I, I genuinely believe it, it It goes against the norm of what, you know, uh, writing a business plan doesn't mean nothing. <laughs> no, it's true. Um, you know, and, and the, the stuff that you I, I genuinely believe that we're, we're told to teach inside the business element, but actually what do you need to know is a, is a different conversation. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's a little bit like the old driving test, isn't it? You oh, pass your yeah. driving test yes. and then you learn how to drive. Yes. And, and, and so this is, this is, this is very similar. And, um, I think cause one of the things I remember being on my course, I was definitely, I felt old. Uh, you know, I was like sort of surrounded by 18, 19, like guys in their sort of early twenties on that course. And they, they, they know no different, you know, they haven't got enormous life skills or anything like that. So they're just going to absorb what the people on the course are instructing them. And so they do enough to pass the course. That little marketing segment is just about like contact your friends, your family, do a little bit of this and like, you're going to be so busy. It's going to be great. And they go out there not knowing any different because they're going to trust what they're told on the course. And then, like I say, that reality kicks in. And I think that if, if, if more, if more trainers were to enter the industry with a business owner mentality, understanding even if their intention is to stay 
j- just them for you know the first couple of years. Okay, that that's that's cool, but still approach it with a business owner mentality. Yeah. The i.e. If, if, if you, if this is a, if this, if, if you imagine this, this business has got different departments and you're going to have say a finance department, you're going to have a sales department, a marketing department, an operations department. And it's a case of at first you're going to be doing all that. Okay. You're going to be doing all of those tasks, but you almost wear a different hat for different times of the day to yeah. achieve those particular roles. And then it's that they, they they, 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 from an early, early stage, then understand that there is more to this because delivery, product delivery is when they're doing the actual sessions, but there's all these other departments that they need to make sure that they are doing the jobs for. One of those is marketing and one of those is sales. So you need to also commit to learning those skills. Exactly. And, you Not know, we've, spoke, we've spoken at length, you know, about, about, you know, it's all very well going off and getting a more CPD within the, the sexy, funky equipment, which is mm-hmm. great because obviously that does allow you to add variety to your sessions. Yeah. But it's, what isn't great is if no one turns up to those sessions. If no one knows about it. <laughs> you know, you could be the world's best kept secret. <clears throat> and, 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 you know, the, the key there is, is, is almost, I, I would say, I, I love being in the classroom. Um, Haley's down in the gym right now with, with the group. I love it. I absolutely love it. I love helping people. I love being at, in the forefront right in the trenches. But I spend more of my time doing the, the financial side, the, mm. the sales side, the marketing side. And I've learned to love that equally, if not more. And I mm. know I, as a business owner, I have to spend more time on all the other things, not the thing I really want to do. So how do you learn, qualify, and kickstart as a FitPro? This is the FitPro Sessions podcast with Parallel Coaching. If you want to grow your business, which is what it is, then that's the commitment you've got to make. Do you reckon that's the the problem, Mo, jumping in? Do you reckon that's the problem? Um, Is that so many people start and they don't necessarily see themselves as a business? 100%. That's definitely the problem. They don't and I call think that seed needs to be sown right at the outset. Yeah. That has to be taught on the training courses. Yeah, agreed. That you're yeah. not just like this little, this little personal trader that goes out there and like goes to people's homes and does a few press-ups with people. Like, like that, that's, that's a part that's almost of a your hobby. role. <laughs> yeah, that's a fun part. You're helping people. You're getting the recognition for transforming their lives. You're interacting with them. You're having a laugh with them. Like that's that's cool. But that's that's only one part of the actual job. Yeah, you've got to commit to learning the other bits as well. They are, I'd say, it's not a case of they are more important than the CPD because I, 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 I do, it's not like do this instead of the CPD, do both. Yes. But it's, so, you know, a, bit, a big part of this thing comes down to, uh, you know, getting good at, at um, how, you, how you plan your day, like the management of time. Uh, one of the things that, that, that I learned out in, in different segments, and, it's, and it's, so right back then when I was doing everything, it was a case of, right, at least one hour a day, that is focused every single day, by the way, that's marketing. Yeah. At least one hour a day is then focused on following up leads and making sales. Back then, at least four to five hours a day was delivery. Yeah. Doing sessions. And then you've got the other parts where you, you know, you're, doing your, you're doing your numbers, but that you could probably get away with doing that like, you know, once a week. You've then got the admin that one hour a day focus on admin and it's it's physically putting those blocks in the day the problem and this is a massive problem that i guess if you go back because because what we've got right now i would i would consider what we have right now as a mini gold rush okay i don't i genuinely do not believe that this industry has woken up to the fact of um the amount of money that is sitting there within Facebook ads. And, uh, and I, I think Facebook ads, they, they, at some point they're going to change. Something's going to happen. But right now, like it, it, it's so much easier to grow your business than it was, say, years ago. So when I first started in the industry, I didn't start with Facebook ads. 
I started with bloody Groupon offers. Nice. Uh, bloody hell, that was hard work. Tire kickers. Like, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So they're coming here getting there. their first 10 sessions for 10 quid. Yeah. And they're like loving that. You make no money off that. You know, you get like half of it from Groupon. So it's like five pounds per person. And, and, and yeah, you, you convert in a very small amount because all they're doing is they're just, they're seasonal. Yeah, just, just taking offers, like whatever offer it is. And, and, and so I was like thinking, geez, like this is, this is real hard graft. And then I remember like just doing leaflet drops, best postcodes and just getting all these, getting all these leaflets, 10,000 leaflets, getting them all delivered. So it, design, the delivery, the, all that. It cost about the printing, cost about 1,500 quid. I got one client off that. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, man. There so must that be was an hard. easier way. <laughs> there must be an easier way. So then I'm building like strategic alliances. And, and so I remember um, I invested in this American company to, um, to sort of show me on the, the sales and marketing side. And, and, and um, it, was very, it, it was just very American. And so like one of the one of the, the the ideas was to send local businesses that have got the type of clients that I want to try and attract, send them a letter with a like a flip flop attached to it. Okay, and it was a case of hey there, like Ricky, local personal trainer. I thought this was a great way of just getting my foot in the door. Okay, so it's like you know this nice, flip flop. I like it. it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So did it work? Not really. I mean, I had a couple of appointments, but it didn't really go anywhere. And then I'm, so, I, I am, I'm, it's hard, hard work, real hard graft. And so I'm, all of a sudden, I'm a few months in. And as I say, I'm doing these Groupon deals. It's building slowly. But I'm then just thinking to myself, this is not happening quick enough. This business not is not growing quick enough. what you it to be. <laughs> Absolutely not. No, no, not at all. And so it was a case then of, right, I need to get my head around. There's got to be an easier way. So I start looking at Google pay-per-click and then, so yeah, this is, this is 2012. So then, then all of a sudden I started to recognize Facebook advertising as being a, a way of doing this. So I, I, I paid for, you know, got on a few courses and, and sort of fast track my knowledge with regards to Facebook advertising, put the first campaign out there. And it's like, bing, 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 bing. All of these leads then coming in, and I was converting them. They're good quality, certainly compared to the Groupon stuff. And I thought, this is it. And here we are, Neil, seven years on. And, and this Facebook gold rush is, is still, still booming. It is still booming <laughs> yeah. to the point whereby, you know, we've now, so just today we've had it confirmed, our sixth location uh, in the UK. So we've now got six locations. And I kid you not, there's no way we could have grown to where we are right now and are committed to continually growing for the next like 18 months and beyond if it was not for the facebook ads it, we'd still do it but it would just take a little bit longer i think like using different avenues and to give and to give some you know some background to that is um you actually run a, a group called pt 100k yeah and and i'd been um sitting on the uh, fence watching you actually for a good i'm gonna say best part of a year I'd jump onto some of your <laughs> webinars and I'd see that you'd had some call to actions on some like mini one day boot camps and you mm -hmm. know invited some some of your early kind of um uh members into PT 100k and then I joined um I had a, a kind of a mini hiatus I suppose from parallel coaching and I wanted to get back in my trenches and in terms of training and doing some mm working with clients and so I jumped inside your inside your group and specifically looked at the the Facebook ads mm. and I can genuinely say like that has transformed our our entire world um, yeah. I went on and I I'm, I'm I kid you not I I watched I I, I binged watched all of the videos <laughs> uh -huh. but there was two videos in there that I watched over and over again and those two videos I think were five or six minutes long each and yep. they've been responsible for well over six figures of, of PT revenue, group-based yep. group revenue. And the impact that's had on Parallel since, wow, I can't even, I would, I would again, six, well, multiple six figures. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, that's all come from how to use Facebook ads 
and position an ad in the right way so that it yeah. works for you. And I hear so often, you know, personal trainers and well, all business owners, I suppose, yeah. um, from mo- multiple industries. I've tried Facebook ads and it didn't work. It was a waste yes. of money. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Why do you reckon exactly. that is? Why do you reckon that is, Ricky? Because they on? haven't they haven't made the commitment to learning it properly. That's the problem. And so, if if I knew, okay, let's say today I was I, I knew nothing about Facebook ads, and I opened up the ads manager, the business yep. manager, and the ads, the you know my ad account, and and I tried to create my first ad. I, I, I'd have. It, it would be overwhelming, okay? Because the fact of the matter is 90, 95% of the features within face, the Facebook ads manager are not actually relevant, certainly for local business marketing. They're not. Yes. And so it's overwhelming. So you've got all these different options. And it's so, it's where it's clever is it's very easy to set up an ad. So you could just watch the Facebook tutorials, which are pretty crap in all honesty. And and so you can set up an ad really easily and you think in your own mind, that's awesome. And then all of a sudden you put it out there and it's, it doesn't take very long to lose a lot of money uh, yeah. with Facebook if you do not know what you're doing. And, and okay? it was, for me, it was, I tried Facebook ads before. I had had some success. What I found very quickly was it was just a number of minor ninja, tiny ninja moves within mm setting it up Mm -hmm. and suddenly i've got qualified leads it was Mm. i would get on the phone you know almost straight out the bat of of somebody you know contacting me back following an ad and i'm Mm. like this is too easy to sell yeah yeah (laughs) yeah that's exactly it and 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 but that's in answer to your question this is the this is the biggest problem is that people do not make the commitment to, to to just learn it properly and it when I say learn it properly, it does not take that long. So yeah. you, what you did, like you say, you binge watched it. You, 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 you kind of watched other videos over and over again. You absorbed it and then you implemented it and tested it out and probably refined things along the way. But it does not. It's not like it takes years to learn. No, not at all. It, it, like, and and it, I think it comes back to what you said earlier about having structure in your day. You know, I've, I've made it for a good couple of years now. I, I have a two 90 minute blocks in the morning and two 90 yeah. minute blocks in the afternoon. So yeah. I remember back in, you know, 2014, 15, when, whenever it was, I was sitting there and for 90 minutes, I would just commit to watching. Um, mm-hmm. I remember one day I watched the same video, this five and a half minute video from yourself um, over and over again for well over an hour. Mm-hmm. And Haley would, would say to me like, you're not watching it again, are you? I was like, I, mm-hmm. I, I might have missed something. Like, let me just, let me just go back. And mm. And it was that commitment to having that structure. And yes, there was a hundred and other one things I could have been doing at that time. Yeah. But it was that commitment to structuring my day and saying, right now I'm learning Facebook ads. Mm. It might not, um, I might not have a return on investment in this 90 minutes, mm-hmm. but going forwards, it will, it will catapult us forwards. That's exactly it. And I just don't think that, um, as you say, it's not just this industry, it's all industries business owners, self-employed people, they do not realize what they're sitting on right now. Like this point in time right now, they do not realize how lucky they are to be in business and this, this untapped resource is just sitting there and it's never been easier to get good quality leads through the door. You only really appreciate it, I think, if you've gone through like just what it was like before, before Facebook ads came on the scene. That's when you (laughs) really, how hard it was, like the the amount of like, you know, just networking, like things like B&I groups and all that. I remember like, you know, going to, I was in Northampton and all the B&I groups around me, they were pretty crap. So the closest best one that I could find was an hour away in Birmingham. And I used to, on a Friday morning, I used to set that alarm. I had to get there for 6.30. So I had to get there every bloody week to get to a decent B&I meeting just so I could network with some good people and I might just get some leads from that. But, you know, there was a commitment on my part to also then pass leads on to them. It was hard, hard work. 
And I remember um, having like so many strategic alliances with barbers yes. and hairdressers yes. and yes. florists. Yes. I'm thinking, where does my where does my ideal client go and buy other things? Yep. And you know, I'd, I'd end up kind of building the relationship so much and they might give me one or two clients now and then, but if there was no yes. guarantee. <laughs> well, you've got to like, commit to it. You've got to really nurture it. You've got to be on top of them. Like it's like ongoing. Mm. And, and lead boxes. That was another one. Having lead boxes in these places, like beauticians and that. I remember having, having those. And, yeah. and, and like you say, I had to go in there every week and just, you know, taking little gifts for the staff in there just to get them to continually ask people and get them to drop their details in the lead box. And I'd go in and collect the leads that week. And it's only if you've, you've gone through all of that that you then realize how bloody awesome Facebook ads are. Do you reckon it's... And I um, couldn't... No, go I on, carry on, say, carry on. I couldn't yep. believe it that, that all of a sudden, a few months later, it literally is like just turning on the tap. Okay, I need some more leads today. Let's turn this tap on. And within an hour, Ping. I've got leads that I can call. Ping. <laughs> I, when um, when I first did my first campaign, and and I set up as you know, I set up and for the listeners at this point, you've you've I've introduced the five AM club of what I did down in Plymouth, but ended up having yeah. hundreds of guides come through. Mm. Um, I remember when I first turned the tap on, so to speak. Um, yeah. it was a it was a strategically planned you know, across four weeks of, of content that I'd, I'd paid for ads. And then I, I put my final kind of big right hook out to, to <laughs> ask. And it was a Friday morning and for about two or three hours, nothing came in. And then by the end of the night, I had over 20 plus applications. And by the end of play Sunday, I had over 80 applications. And I only <laughs> want, I was only after eight, um, eight guys in Plymouth. And it, mm -hmm. it was that what I learned of being very specific on my ad. And I'd called out males above 30 that had a particular problem. And my inbox was like, ping, ping, ping. I, I, I remember messaging you and saying, thank you. But I've also got a new problem now, Ricky. I remember yeah. saying, um, what do I do with all these leads? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, and it well, was what a nice problem to have. What a nice problem to have. And I think that's one of the things I learned most was, there was a strategy and that's what I was missing in Facebook mm. ads of what was the purpose of, of, of Boo sponsoring a, a video? What was the purpose of sponsoring this particular blog? What was mm. the copy on the final um, pitch mm. and where do I want them to go next? Mm -hmm. And what was the next landing page? What did that look like? And what was the objective? And I think that's what I, I see a lot of people miss out on. They think, you know, I'm going to do a like campaign and they yeah. get lots of likes on a post or lots of likes on, a, on, a, on their page. But that doesn't actually mean anything. It was, yeah. a, it was where do I want them to go next and why do I want them to go there? So that right there is a key thing because with the ad, again, I see one of the problems these days. Again, it's not just our industry, but if we're talking uh, about the health and fitness industry, a lot of guys, they try to do all of the selling about their program in that ad yeah so the they reveal everything everything the times um uh, of the sessions where it's located and so it, like and, and the price and every everything's all in that one ad and they're like like this is amazing value for money this is like so awesome because they know how awesome it is but the, the people reading that they're like okay yeah that's nice i might give it a like but that's all that they're getting and so the point of the ad is not to make the sale the point of the ad is to just get them to the next step that's it. Get them to the next step. And then in the next step, the point of that is to get them to the next step. And so you don't reveal your whole hand straight away. Yeah. It's kind of like a, a staircase, isn't it? Yes. You know, and the, the sale is at the very top of the staircase. You've got 13 steps. Yeah. So the for me, I always think, you know, the first couple of steps are, hey, I'm over here. Look at my video. Mm -hmm. They get to know me. The second mm -hmm. step is, hey, read my blog. Get to like yeah. me. And yeah. then, you know, go and do the next, the next ad or whatever that might be. Um, trust me. And I keep doing that. And it's not until they then land on a particular landing page, they leave an email address and I follow that up. But I start to yep. build up this equity in them where I have now mm -hmm. the permission to say, hey, Ricky, should we jump on a call and have a meaningful conversation? Sure. If you buy, fantastic. If you don't buy, I'm okay. <laughs> That's, it. That's exactly it. And you get to the top of the staircase and, and in an ideal world, if you've lined up all of those steps, 
Versailles is a given. The, there was a, um, uh, a lot of research done years ago by an American guy. I've shared it in the group before, actually. You might remember um, the, the Chet Holmes pyramid. There's a very successful sales guy. He's, he's unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, but this, this, this guy, Chet Holmes, he's got a book. What's it called? I've got it here. The Ultimate Sales Machine. The Ultimate Sales um, Machine. Yep. The Ultimate Sales Machine. Yeah, really, really good book. And there was tons of research done. You know, I say this is a guy who's worked with Tony Robbins and like he's responsible for billions of sales with big, big companies. And um, uh, with his company, that they, they, they did all this research. And what they found for any meaningful pur- purchase was that at any given time, there's only 3%. So if you were to, if you had a, an audience there of, of say 100 people and you got up and you said, right, who is looking to get in amazing shape over the next six weeks? Who, who's basically in the mood to buy a personal training program today? 3% will put their hand up. And that could be, so it could be a car, a house. It could be a new three-piece suite. Anything, there's, there'll be 3% of the audience that will put their hand up and say, yes, that's us. There's then 7% that are open to the idea. So really, if you think about it, you've only got 10%, a maximum of 10, three that are hot, another 7% that are are warm, that are ready, that are literally today thinking, yep, I'm I'm seriously looking at this. That's so small. Yet that 3% is who everyone is after. (laughs) <laughs> crazy and right <laughs> it's mad it's madness so everyone's competing for the three percent because they all want the sale today whereas the clever people are actually the marketers they're willing to just be a little bit patient and play a slightly longer game and so what they're willing to do is is build the relationship like you just said there using the staircase analogy and if you do that because You've then got, it's, it's broken down, like you could Google Chet Holmes Pyramid and it'll, it will show you, but the next 30%, they, it's something that's kind of on their to-do list, but they're just not looking at it today. But once you've built up this relationship with them, that next 30%, they are going to turn into your clients because whether it's next week or next month, all of a sudden, they're going to make the decision that, Now's the time. Something, something's happened, okay? And so they've made the decision. And rather than go onto Google and type in personal trainer Northampton or wherever it is, they're not going to do that because we've built a relationship with them via email, through our videos, through <clears throat> retargeting, and then all of a sudden there's only one person that they're going to contact. And it's that's the, the person yeah. that's just been offering this amazing free content that's been informative, been educational. They've learned stuff along the way. They've seen them on camera. They've connected with them, even though like, we don't realize that. They feel like they've got to know us. And then it's like, I'm, I'm going to Neil. So how do you learn, qualify, and kickstart as a FitPro? This is the FitPro Sessions podcast with Parallel Coaching. There's more else going. going to Neil. Uh, over the last few years, uh, well, since 2012, Haley and I, we've done a lot of coaching with Tony Robbins and we've done business mastery and whatnot and something, yep. um, there's a funny buzzing. Can you hear that? Is that okay? I can't oh, hear it. Cool. Um, anyway, and um, some, he brought a, a guest speaker up on stage a couple of years ago and he said that it takes roughly 30 interactions or 30 touches with a prospect before they're going to step into a meaningful conversation. And that still doesn't mean they're going to buy or not. And I think this is something we see, it comes back to, we've used the word consistency a couple of times. It's being consistent and saying, how Mm. quickly can I elegantly deploy 30 bits of free content that adds value? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so many, I I see in all industries, but certainly within PTs is they might only send an email once a week. They might Mm -hmm. only say, uh, do one post on Facebook every other day or reach out and add value to the, to the free content world, you know, every other day. And consequently their 30 touches lines up in several weeks time. And now go back to your Chet Holmes principle Mm. at that point, are those 3% actually looking at your content ready to buy? And now we wonder Mm -hmm. why there's no one putting their hands up saying, can we talk or yes, I'm interested. Whereas those people that are 
putting content out ferociously on a day-to-day basis and are consistent yep. as fuck, <laughs> you know, yep. emailing every day that are social, you know, social media every day, their 30 touches line up very quickly. Mm. And now those 3% that are ready to buy or the 7% that are thinking about it or the 30% that are in the background watching, yeah. they, in my opinion, they just see parallel coaching are very consistent. Their message, they're beating the same drum day in, day out. You're staying at the front, at the forefront of their mind. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that that daily consistency, when I say daily, by the way, Monday to Friday, it doesn't always have to be weekends is, is something that I've learned. Yeah, no, I, I agreed. A hundred percent. Definitely, definitely a Monday to Friday thing. Um, I would say that that, that daily consistency, when it, you, you can apply this to absolutely anything when you're trying to create a new, a new habit. If you're setting a goal, I mean, I've, I've done so much stuff over the years with regards to goal setting and goal achievement. And one of the things, there's, there's so, I've got so many books on, 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 on all of this. And everyone talks about smart goals. That's a very corporate way of looking at it. And like, there's a certain amount of, um, um, weight that should be applied to that, you know, having a specific goal and, 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 you know, a specific date and then how you're going to measure it and all that kind of thing. But the one thing that I very rarely see mentioned in a lot of these books and articles about goal setting is you make this commitment, you visualize it, but it's the daily consistency. You have to do something every single day, even if you're only setting aside, say 30 minutes each day, whereby You are focused on it. The big mistake I make, and the reason I think that, and the reason that so many people do not achieve the goals that they set out, because it's easy to go through. Goal setting exercises are brilliant. You know, they, they're imaginative and like people get excited. The endorphins all release when they start talking about this amazing future. But the problem then is that they don't do anything to, to do with that goal until a week later. Yes. And they might, and they'll, they'll do it and then it's like, okay. And then they just get caught up in day-to-day stuff. And then they'll revisit it again a week later. And that's not enough. It has to be every single day, as I say, even if it's just a little bit each day. And so one of the things that, um, that I found helped, and this means that to sort of contradict what I say slightly here, even if you're only doing like a little bit each day, even if it's just like 10 minutes, but you did include the weekends just until it becomes a habit, is to have like a wall planner up on your wall, just like one of those wall calendars, and you just put a cross in that first day when you, 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 whatever it is, whether it's like, you know, you're getting fitter or if, if you, uh, you want the discipline of writing a book. So I've done this when like we wrote a book um, or if it's like the commitment to a goal. And you just put a cross, like day one, cross. And then you do it the next day, okay? You've done something on that the next day. And then the next day you do another one. At the end of the week, you've got a chain. And then if it's in front of you, so if it was like this and it's like in, in front of your desk, uh, by your computer so you can see it every single day all of a sudden you look up and you've got this chain and the importance of not breaking that chain it forces you to do it every single day because all of that seven days that turns into 14 days that's a big old chain and there's no way you want to break the chain like no the, the longer it get. gets yeah, yeah I, can, I hear you don't you. want to you, you don't want to break the chain that's something that, uh, that was a tip from Seinfeld, actually, that he, he shared with people, like, to do with, because uh, he made the commitment to, like, coming up with, like, you know, new content for his jokes and everything, and he just said that that's, that's what he does. That's how he has yeah. the discipline. I think Stephen King has the same kind of thing when it comes to writing books. And it's just, so having that, so we do talk about consistency, but, but that's a really good way of, um, at first, if you're starting something new, to force yourself to show up every day and put something out content-wise. Even, even now, um, it's actually literally just out of my reach on my right. Uh, bear with me, two ticks. Go on. Uh, all I do, and, and, and this will go on YouTube so everybody will see, literally, this is, I, I take this everywhere. It is literally my, what I class as my holy grail. It's yep. October 2019. It's a monthly any uh, of the month de- every day and it's literally what an inch and a half per day and inside that there's 
tiny little boxes that reflect what we do on YouTube, what we do on social media, what we do on email, what we do inside the business. And you've just hit the nail on the head in terms of there must be a tick in there and I see a chain link up. Mm -hmm. And I get to the end of the month and I've got last month's score on here yeah. of what yeah. I achieved in certain areas. And I'm like, yeah. I am nowhere am I going to score below what I did last month. See it. And, and you just keep going and you keep going. One thing I, you know, we teach on course in terms of goal, uh, achieving a goal is applying the principles of, of periodization to mm -hmm. whatever they're trying to do in a, in, a new, in a new goal. So for example, take somebody that is... I used to do a lot of running, still do do a lot of running, ultra marathon. Now, I didn't go out and suddenly go from running 5K uh, to, say, 100K. You mm. know, I did a couple of weeks at 5K, a couple of weeks at 7K, a few weeks at 10K, and I slowly built that up. And it's the same within achieving a goal. Mm. I might just do, you know, take, for, for example, I want to learn Facebook ads. In the first couple of weeks, I might just do five minutes every day. Yeah. And in the next couple of weeks, I might do 10 minutes every day. And if I slowly build up that time in that logical progress, like I would in a training perspective, learning, you know, yeah. going to ultra marathon or whatever the training goal is, suddenly it becomes easy. Well, yeah. I see so many people to achieve their goal, they jump two feet in, they go, right, I'm going to go ferociously at it and, and do, you know, two hours a day and then realize mm -hmm. at the end of a week that that just wasn't achievable. Yeah. And now they don't have this nice chain of seven days where they've done action. Well, they just stop. I so put something out there too quickly and it doesn't work. And then that's it. Facebook ads don't work for me. Exactly. And, and now we have a new belief. Facebook yeah. ads don't work. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. And it's Amazing. rubbish. It's a um, false belief. It's a false belief. It's a false belief. So jumping over to, um, let, let's segue back slightly then. Um, yeah. You've qualified in, in fitness. You've, you've done yeah. the early stages as a boot camp in and around Northampton. You've yeah. gone out and done your Groupon deals and, and you know, worked your ass off to get people in. What, yeah. what, what have you done since? Tell us more about kind of the 2014 to date for Ricky Knight. And so yeah, uh, well, the thing is, cause it was out, it was outside and I was very conscious of the fact that it was, uh, not going to work. I, for women uh, already, I was getting a few complaints about what you're going to do when it like gets cold and wet and all that sort of thing. So I started looking for places to move into. And there was a local boxing club and then there was for the evening sessions, I ended up using like a local dance studio until I found somewhere. And then in 2013, we actually moved into our unit in Northampton. So we got our own location and we are still in there uh, today. Um, so we, we got a location that was way too big for what we needed at the time. And because I think I only had about, I think I only had about 40 members at that point. And we got a 2,700 square foot unit. So it was way too big for what we needed. But I negotiated a deal with them whereby um, it was a staggered rent payment. And so uh, we wouldn't end up paying full rent on it until month 10. And so I think the first three months were hardly anything and then after that it went up slightly and then up slightly again so it's very much staggered and staged and so it just meant that I, I just looked at like what was working already and I was like just working things out and it's kind of a case of okay so if we get this many people in each month we convert this many people to members we can gradually increase our membership each and every month and then by the time it comes to needing to pay full rent then we're going to have enough members to uh, to cover that. So we did all of that and you know, that, that worked really well, but I then, I then, I remember at the end of year one, that was when I sat down with, um, a few different franchise consultants because, because of what had happened in the previous industry. And we talked about learning from mistakes. The problem, one of the reasons our business went, went down was because we, borrowed way too much money okay so it was fine when the market was buoyant but as soon as the market crashed we were we were completely fucked we just could not our, our outgoings were like 110 grand a month you know just wow. to cover our bills wow. just to stay in business and so 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 we just couldn't afford to service the debt and the outgoings so <clears throat> it, it it forced me into 
like a different way of thinking, which was, okay, so when, when, we, when we start this business, we're going to bootstrap it. And when we grow it, I want to be able to grow it in a way whereby we're not having to borrow money. Amazing. So, Amazing. So, so, so the franchise model seemed to, seemed to fit. So I remember sitting down with these consultants and I said, like, how long do we need to be in business? This is a model that's working. How long do we need to be in business really before potential franchisees are going to take us seriously? Yeah. And they said, ideally five years, three to five years. Um, they said, you can do it over the next six to 12 months, but it's, you might not get such good take up. And actually I took that on board. And so I just then chose to, uh, you know, refine our systems and uh, got to the point whereby I, I was then uh, not doing so much training myself. Um, Alex, my wife, she was on board and then we got a trainer on board as well, a couple of part-time trainers. And so I was then, I took a step back and then that's when I decided because the, the franchise idea was one that I was committed to, but it was just like, I thought, right, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be five years really of us being open before we can like seriously expand that. So um, that's when I started looking at online stuff. And the, the other thing regarding the PT 100 stuff, just to come back to that for a second was, like I said, I, 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 invested in this American company and I just thought that the material, I'd, like it was a few grand I'd invested and the material I felt was outdated. Like the whole flip flop foot in the door, that sort of stuff. It's like, this is outdated stuff. This is, this, 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 this is not gonna, you know, I don't feel like getting value for money. You know, I'm spending a few grand on this. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's particularly great content. And they started trying to, uh, you know, ram other things like, um, you know, operational stuff down my throat. But at that point, I didn't care about the operational stuff. I just cared about making sales, marketing and sales. For me, most important thing, I needed to grow the business. So when I started then investing in the Facebook marketing side of things and, 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 and getting my head around that and then using stuff that worked, I just thought, like with the PT100, that, that was just, it was almost like a little hobby just on the side. It was never a plan for it to grow into anything massive. It was just... Do you know what? All I'm going to do here is record a little five minute video of what is working for me based on the stuff that I've learned, what, I'm, what I've then used and experimented with in our own gym. It's worked. So, you know, I'd never record a video of the stuff that didn't work. It was like, this is working, five, 10 minutes, and then upload it to a little membership site and then just charge people, you know, 40, 50, 60 quid a month, whatever it was, to to then be a member and then they could access that content and then they could absorb it themselves and try it out themselves. And it was just a low cost membership that I thought if I'm, if I'm finding this useful, there must be a few others out there that would find this useful as well. And that, that, that was kind of it. And then it, it just kind of grew actually quite quickly because yeah. it clearly was something that uh, people were finding quite useful. And there was no, it's not as if I was, um, I was doing anything. I wasn't, I wasn't selling a load of sizzle or anything. I was just going back to what we said right at the beginning. I was just being me. I was just being authentic. It was yeah. just like, look, this is working for me. It might work for you. And, and that's, was, that, that's what <laughs> I loved about it was, was from my perspective, I could relate directly to you and everybody else I knew inside PT1 Education. We, you, you, were, you were doing something we wanted. And yeah. you made you made what this this complex topic sound incredibly simple because yeah. it was simple. And yeah. you know, the, although there, there were five, ten minute clips of click here, do this, this is what you want to say, and there was a little there was coaching around it, mm -hmm. it, it broke down all of the barriers of making this this harder than it needed to be. Yeah. Hi, I'm Neil Bergman. And I'm Hayley Bergman. Over the last 10 years, we've helped thousands of fitness professionals to get qualified, learn with simplicity, and coach clients with confidence. We're the first to say that learning and being a fit pro doesn't have to be hard work, and that with the right structure, support, and resources, you can become a confident and knowledgeable fitness professional that is dedicated to more. So how do you learn, qualify, and kickstart as a fit pro? This is the Fit Pro Sessions podcast with Parallel Coaching.